That's what they're Um, ask questions, pay attention. It's really good training. Um, these guys are kind of our go-to uh, for water treatment and, and uh, are, are super knowledgeable. So thank you guys very much for coming. And uh, yeah, turn it over to you. Appreciate it, man. Thanks. All right. Well, as Ryan said, my name is James. Um, I've been here in the Valley now doing this for over 10 years now. So and doing it prior to that. In California. Uh, my background was actually in watershed systems, so I studied the whole water cycle and how it goes through the environment all the way from the ocean, you know, evaporation through the atmosphere, coming back down perfectly through. But that being said, there's a lot of the chemistry that's involved in that that we use every day in what we're doing. Um, so, you know, a lot of the sources of the water that we have here in Arizona are a little bit, you know, we've got a kind of a mixed bag from the canal system um, and the well system and some of our river systems. So some of you may have experienced it when you're looking at the city water that's coming into some of your systems if you're testing, you'll see a change throughout the year multiple times. So for that reason, it's one of the um, key components of why it's so important in Arizona, not just because of the cooling side of things, but it's very important to understand the water and what we're starting with and how it changes so frequently. And it definitely adds some challenges. It certainly makes Arizona one of the hardest places to treat water and use it for process systems than most other places in the country. So um, that being said, we did hand out this little quick, uh, quick questionnaire or quiz, if you will, um, just to try to get a, a, a little read on your knowledge so that we can then focus on you know the little components that you know. You know, will help you grow and learn something more. So we want to, we really want to focus on places where there's the lowest degree of knowledge base to start with. So they, they want to fill it out, yeah, right? And we'll collect. Well, they, if they can fill it out, you don't put your name on it, and you, or you can take it home, and you can take notes with it as well. But um, I like to just go through it right off the bat. So we're going to start with, you know, question one. And if anybody's got the answer to this one, what are the components that make up hardness? No, okay. Okay, we're halfway there. What else? Two main components that make up hardness: salt, calcium, and magnesium. Okay, so when you test, when you're testing for hardness, a lot of the uh, water treatment companies will just test for calcium hardness because it's the most prevalent. We generally test for total hardness because both of them add to, uh, you know, the some of the treatments that you know add. 
they both combine in your water system. So we need to know how much the total is. It, it tends to give us a little bit better reading. There's always a little bit of maybe in there as well. So, um, so what's the difference between conductivity and TDS? Does anybody know? Many of you have seen a meter like this, for instance, or you've got your control or something similar. It has conductivity and has a TDS button. But what's the difference between the two? TDS is what salts does it well. What does TDS stand for? Total dissolved. Right. So then what would conductivity mean? Wouldn't that be the more like the drunk in the water? Well, it's conductivity. The definition is how well it will conduct on a current, if you will, right? So if you've got electrolytes like salt, for instance, in your water, it's going to conduct electricity better. If you have pure water, like totally pure water, like DI distilled water, it won't conduct a current. Okay, so you can't pass electricity through. So what we do with these is we'll, we typically all your control systems for running your cooling towers and boiler systems and stuff will have a conductivity probe in there. It's measuring the electrical conductance as a representative of how much TDS is in there. But in order to truly know what TDS is, you would literally have to test for every single thing that can dissolve in water and then total it all up and give it number. What these meters actually do when you push the TDS button on there, is it they're basically making a, uh, a an approximation of the most prevalent you know dissolved ions in that solution and, there, and it's, there's a sort of a ratio between conductivity but it's not linear because as you certain salt certain things like sodium chloride table salt has a different conductance than say potassium chloride or if you have a bunch of iron in the system or you've got a bunch of acid in the system each ion will conduct the current slightly differently, mainly because of their molecular size is a main component to it, as well as what we call their, you know, electronegativity or positive, you know, how 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 more how reactive they really are. So long, it's a long definition, but essentially TDS and conductivity are two different things. You'll hear them used a lot. In, you know, a lot of the older engineers and old folks that have been doing this for you know 40 years are still used to just saying TDS. What they really mean is conductivity because everything's controlled through an electrical sensor, you know, if you will. So, okay, so this one's a little more technical. What's the flow rate through a 1000 ton condenser? Anybody know that rule of thumb? A lot. Fast. <laughs> rule of thumb is for a 1000 ton condenser, we got roughly around three gallons per minute per ton. So if you got a thousand tons, you got three thousand GPM. So that will tell you. So if you're trying to like, if you're trying to determine, okay, what's the size of my cooling tower? How many tons? What, how much capacity? You know, what cooling do we have there? A lot of times you can look at your pump, your condenser water pump, and see it. Not all of them put the GPM flow rate on it, but that will tell you. Then you can just take that number divided by three. If you if they don't have it on the condenser pump. Sometimes they'll have a one on an evaporator pump, and that rule is more like a 2.8 gallons per minute per ton, and that way you can kind of extrapolate. So you know to determine what's my tower dumpage. So when you're looking at it, you walk into a new building, you're like, "Hey, how big is this tower?" And you're just guessing. You don't have to sit there and count every single water source heat pump in the building or every coil in the building and total them all up. You can usually find it a little quicker, and, that, and then. That we then use for a number of our other treatments, like how much our blow down is going to need, how much makeup we're going to need, how much chemicals we're going to need. So it is, it is good to know. All right, so this is another one of the more technical questions. You should know this if you went to school. How many BTUs are rejected for a one ton AC unit? Ricker. Yep. 12,000. 12,000 12, BTUs. Yeah, you should know that. Yes, sir. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so here's another one of those rule of thumb that we look at. How much water is evaporated for a cooling tower with a flow rate of 1,000 GPM in a delta T of 10 degrees? 10%. That's why it's less than that. 1%. 1%, 1 of the research rate 
So 1% of the 1,000 GPM flow rate gives you 10 gallons of a minute, 10 gallons a minute of evaporation. So again, that goes into calculating how much water are we going to need in that cooling tile? You know, 10 gallons a minute, how many minutes are in a day? 14,400 minutes in a day. So you can, you, can, you can go through a lot of water really quick, right? That's, that's how much is evaporating on that size of the system. Now, that's, that's a pretty decent size uh, tower or a thousand pounds. Maybe not all of you probably have buildings quite that big, but we do have plenty of them around here. Okay, so what is the purpose of the tower? Each minister to save water. Bingo. No. Bingo. Saving water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Just because it's called a cooling tower, its purpose isn't to cool. You can do that in a lot of different ways, right? It's to save water. So because we're we're evaporating all that water, the purpose of the cooling tower is so that we can use that water multiple times over, which in turn saves water. So if we do if we're doing one spring cooling like they do in a lot of the power plants because they're usually right next to a river or an ocean, they pull it in and send it right back out. But here in Arizona, it's very important because you know we, that way we can use that water three, four times, maybe more, depending on where we're at. So that means we're saving water. You still get the same amount of evaporation, but if you increase the number of times you used it, you have less blowdown, which means you have to add more less water to the cooling tower. So anywhere where they're using cooling towers, some, some of the places out east, they're constantly running eight or nine cycles because they have really good, soft, high quality water and it's got a really low conductivity. So it's not loaded up with a bunch of salts to start with that lead to deposits on your cooling tower. So or your, you know, your heat exchange services. That's the main reason. So remember that one. Does anybody have an idea what condenser approach is? How oh, efficient move power is. Okay, that's that's a that's a loosely <laughs> worded uh, well, answer. I actually thought that too. So. You'll I most of you, if you have killer systems, you'll log this. It, it's usually. Uh, kind of calculated automatically for you on your control board that you got a newer one. But essentially, it's how close you can get the water in your condenser to that saturation that, that basically your, your wet bulb. Okay, right? The closer you get to it, the more efficient your power is. So if you've got a if you've got like a uh, an approach on the chiller that's like six, seven, eight, ten degrees, that thing needs to be clean. One, it first probably needs to be brushed. It might be foul. They have some scaling. So those are things. Every one of those children manufacturers, I don't care if you got a carrier or a train or a York or you know, whatever else is out there, every one of them have a design spec and they put it badly. And usually they're shooting for less than two degrees. A couple of them allow for it to go a little bit higher. It's just design whether you know whether you're running like, you know, uh which type of chiller you're running. They've got a little more flexibility. If you've got all those variable drives and all that other fun stuff on there, they'll allow for a little bit more. But for the most part, the lower your approach, the more efficient your equipment is running and the more energy you save. So your property managers that are paying those electric bills, they don't want to see a high approach because the bills go up precipitously. And then we'll, we'll go through more of that in the, in the handbook. You'll see some examples. Just what that is. So, can the approach, so am I right in saying it's basically your basin temperature, basic water temperature compared to your saturation yep. temperature? Same. Yeah. Okay. Right. It's essentially what it is. Is that how well they get a little more? They get, yeah, they get a little more specific with chillers than if you're just running a, just like a fluid cooler, for instance. You know, your fluid cooler, it's only going to get that water as cold as it possibly can. Right, and you're constantly putting heat back in with that tube bundle in there. So it's a little trickier to fig figure that out, you know. But a lot of times these things will be running 85 degrees in the summer in your, you know, your your tower temperature water because essentially the condenser is really actually the closed loop, right? Right, not the tower, right? Whereas on a chiller system, you got to build the tower, so you got a condenser loop because. That, that's where that heat transfer between the refrigerant and the water is. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So, on a fluid cooled building, that heat transfer technically is really more off of your heat pump, where it's, it's cooling the refrigerant back down so that it can blow the cooler. So, then it, you know, when you go through the compression and release it, so you can cool it 
cool that down because it heats up pretty quick. You know, from all that that heat transfer, so you can't cool that down. So it's just it's just where the condenser is in the city. Yeah. The chiller does if it's more central than you know your 150 or 400 heat water source heat pumps or something. You know, exactly. yeah. <laughs> you know but, so okay. So beyond that, any any questions or are there anything? Is there anything that anybody wants to know about? And that way we can start focus on that. Anything? Well. I had heard that they're going to start, or they're starting to think about using reclaimed water for drinking water. Is that going to have a factor in our conductivity, our makeup waters? Will there be more? It depends on what they're going to do to treat it, because reclaimed water is going to have to go through a lot of treatment before it can become drinking water. Right. Now, they are already using reclaimed water for some. Clean water makeup systems, and we've got a couple of them around that that we treat for that. There is a lot of other stuff in there. One of which that we typically have to watch for is it's it's got a lot of orthophosphate in it. So we have which is different than the phosphate, the phosphonates that we're typically treating on the cooling towers, but it interferes with that exchange and it wants to kind of bind things up because it's not as soluble and it's not as tolerant to the hardness that we have in this water. So there's, a, there's some tweaks and there's kind of a threshold. Another thing that you get with it is you get higher silica levels. So if you're running a chiller system, normally our silica coming out of the tap is pretty low. So we don't, you know, we're down maybe 15 at the, 15 parts per million at the most. So we, don't, we never get to that threshold. Uh, you know, the, the threshold for silica in a, like a chiller system pretty much maxes out at 150 parts per million. But if you're using reclaim, it's effectively already been concentrated. So we, so then you can effectively start hitting that that's that saturation point, if you will, or threshold, just like you would with scale or hardness. Is that if something we not, should start checking, or can we, as engineers? You can, can, but I don't think so. You would know it if you're using reclaim water in your system because there's there's a lot of other things that you have to do. Air gaps being one, so it can't interfere with the, the domestic water. And you typically have both as a maybe potential source. Right. So there's some things that you would have to mechanically have. Oh, uh, well, you would know that today. If you're using it for your cooling towers, if they start using it with city water, you'll definitely see higher everything higher conductivity, higher hardness, higher alkalinities because it's all concentrated. Mm. So as long as you have it, if you knew that you had a good solid source of just regular city water versus you know what you think is coming out of your, you know your supply now then you'd see it much much not too much different from when the the, the water supply changes here in the valley and from spring and fall like it does and sometimes throughout the year yeah. where you'll see that jump or drop in your conductivity as well as hardness and alkalinity that we get that you you know you don't see it much up where you're at bill because I wish you're that state are really heavy. but a lot of the places Especially in <laughs> downtown Phoenix seems pretty big, you know, like just very yeah, early. And Ryan had buildings in downtown Phoenix where we could go check it in the morning. Yeah. And then by the time we checked it in the afternoon, they had yeah. closed the well and you could tell that instantly. Yeah. yeah wow. Well, and so yeah. then you're scrambling, you're changing set points and right. rates. Chandler and Tempe are by far the most variable. So they're always moving. It's like, it's like it doesn't matter what time of year it doesn't matter any, anymore it used to be very consistent it was like once in spring once yeah. in fall mm -hmm. but nowadays whatever they're doing with the water supply they're switching wells and pumps and canal water and it's just sometimes it can be you know five six times in a month mm -hmm. it's just like it gets really hard to dial your system in you know where you're at so any anything else or any more clarification on that I know there. I know there has been a push in the state to reduce our water consumption, so it will get more and more important to find ways to maximize the water savings that you can get. Because I mean, you, I don't know, many of you have probably heard that in the news. They want to cut our our usage by thirty percent. I think it's really hard when you keep adding how many thousands of people a day moving into the city and all the construction that we're doing, but. Whatever, build a house, and like, you know, yeah, bulk works. <laughs> Yeah. So, okay, so you all should have one of these handbooks. You're, you're more than welcome to keep it, take it home, put yourself to sleep reading it, whatever you need to. But 
it is a good reference. Any any of the control manuals that you know for any of you that have us as our as your current water treatment vendor, you will have a copy of this usually in your the, the three ring binder manual as well. So you can always flip through and you're like, what does that mean again? It's usually in the back of that manual. But this is something you can keep in your desk or maybe a little bill. I'm testing you on this on Monday. You got it. <laughs> you got it. So, so I can keep James on the speed up. <laughs> so we touched a little bit on hardness already. That's kind of the first one in here. So again, it does, it just reiterates measure of calcium and magnesium ions. Okay. So that doesn't mean that it's pure calcium. It's usually calcium carbonate, calcium bicarbonate, if you will, when it's when it's in a solid form. But once it goes into the water, it dissolves just like salt water. To a point, okay. So that's the that's the main the main reason why we have to do water treatment in this city and in general is because of hardness. That is probably the main component of what we have to deal with. And the reason for that is again, it's it's because it has what we call retrograde solubility. So essentially, what that means is it is inversely soluble with regard to temperature. Whereas everything else, if you keep increasing the temperature, you can dissolve more and more of said salts in that solution to a point. Calcium and magnesium are the opposite. But why, why is that so important when you're talking about cooling systems or boiler systems? You're adding a lot of heat to it. You add heat, where's it going to go? At some point, especially if you're at threshold saturation, it's going to play it out on that heat exchange surface, the hottest point. Well, the downside to calcium carbonate, if you will, if we just pick one of them, is it is a strong insulator. It's essentially what the, you know, those tiles on the bottom of the space shuttle where the rockets are, when they come back in, they're, all that heat that's generated from just all that atmosphere coming, you know, coming in at high speed, that's, those tiles that they've got on there are basically calcium carbonate and compounds. And it's to try to resist the heat from penetrating into the fuselage. So that's why we don't want that in the cooling system because, again, it negatively impacts your heat transfer and efficiency. So that right there, because of that retrograde solubility, is why we have to treat the water and why we limit our we have to limit our cycles. Probably the main thing to it. The the compound alkalinity being the next one down from that. There's three things that make up alkalinity, and you'll see it written in there, right? We've got hydroxides, which is one of the strongest bases that you're going to get, right? It's very, very basic. So you can make calcium hydroxide. And we've got carbonates and bicarbonates. Carbonates being, you know, your, your CO3, whatever, you know, and your HCO3, right? So those mix combined with the hardness, the calcium or magnesium, and they form a rather strong bond. They don't want to break apart once they do so. It's not like, it's not like salt that you crystallize and you can dissolve it really easily. Once you make it, once it forms, it's pretty hard with, with the exception of the hydroxide because the calcium hydroxide or magnesium hydroxide is always soluble. It will. So we don't have to worry about that one so much. And there's, there's very little in the system anyways. But you do, we do have a lot of the other alkalinities in there, mainly the bicarbonates and the um, carbonates. So again, that's why when we test, we check alkalinities and we check hardness. Because those, so at certain at certain thresholds, certain limits and parts per million of each of those, it almost it doesn't matter how much chemistry we throw in there. The only way to stop it at that point is acid. And that becomes another potential problem for your equipment. It can only handle so much of it. So that leads into the pH. So what's pH again? A real long complicated form definition, the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. Yeah. So essentially what that means is if you've got so to, to break it down a little simpler than one of the so pH, anybody know what the scale is for pH? 7.18. What, what's the range? 0 to 8. 7 to 8. 7 to 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8. 8
Zero to 14. What's neutral? Seven. Neutral is seven, right? Okay. Did you hold that? Which side is acidic and which side is basic? Zero to seven is acidic. Seven. Zero to seven. This is the acid side, right? Right? Okay, so on that range, there's a whole lot of other things that happen. Certain compounds, like so if if we've got a bunch of scale in the system, like I have to do one of these tomorrow, I have to ask to wash the chiller. I got to drive that pH down far enough to get all that calcium hydrogen and carbonate to break up and go in, into solution. Usually I have to get it down below two, a lot of times down to one, depending on how hard it is. So I have to drive, I have to use a lot of acid to get that to dissolve, like concrete. You know, when you're etching concrete, what do they typically use? Muriatic acid, which is basically hydrochloric acid, right? So that's the problem. The problem is with that, your whole system is made out of a lot of different metals, right? Typically, you've got carbon steel and copper and some brass in most systems. If you've got a real high-end system, you might have stainless or you might have some other, you know, high-end components. But for the most part, those metals, they don't like a low pH either. So if you're having to do this repetitively, you're stripping metal off at the same time, making the walls thinner and thinner, and then you got leaks, right? If you're doing so that repetitively, then you got a problem. Issues. You got other yeah. problems. Yeah, exactly. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have to do this. So what we typically try to run in our tower chemistry or, or condenser water usually is more like, we're shooting for more like eight and a half to about nine, okay? So we're up, we're up a little bit higher. If we get too high, we start negatively impacting the copper. If we, but the car, the steel, the iron, it loves it. It's, you can go all the way to 14 almost, and it loves it. You can get some brittle list from it because it, it just loves having that high pH. So if you're like, oh, well, then I, all I have is iron in my system. Let's just run that pH as high as we can go because it will naturally increase as you run through your cycles in your system. That the pH will naturally continue to climb. So some systems do have acid programs where they trickle in a little bit of acid to try to keep that pH in that range because they want to run a little higher cycles. There's another benefit to doing that. It eats up a bunch of the alkalinity so that there's nothing for the hardness to bond to or a lot less so they can cheat the system a little bit. But you got to be extra vigilant at maintaining that in those, in those centers watching it like hot almost, almost like, like a daily oh it's got to be you've got to have continuous monitoring with alarms that'll go off Ooh. and typically the acid that we would use if we were doing an acid program would be sulfuric acid you know something around like 96 percent plus or whatever yeah. and that's nobody wants to handle that either <laughs> you know ironically it's safer at 96 percent than at like 70 percent but it dilutes pretty quickly when it hits it so you know you just you just don't want to play with it there's been a few people that have that use it, and I even think the VA hospital here has an acid program, but it blew up in their face once. So the safer and more natural way just keep from normal blow down in the Yeah, the safest way, the safest way to maintain pH is just keep your blood out within a certain range. There, we've got limits also on alkalinity and hardness, and you know, which we typically hit first for pH, but sometimes the city's sending us water out of the tap at 8.1. You know, they're not helping us. No. <laughs> you know, so um, let's see. What else do we want to talk about with pH? Um, there'll be probably some more stuff we'll, we'll come up with. You chatted briefly in the, through the, the uh, quiz. I have a question. Um, yes, I don't know. So I'm just, kind of confused. An explanation no. on that. No. Conductivity. Is someone asking a question online? Yeah, I'm asking a question. As You're talking about pH. This is Brian. Uh, you're talking about pH, but most buildings have copper and steel piping for their closed loop on a California heat pump system. Correct. How would you maintain that balance between the pH for the pH between steel pipe and copper pipe? Right. So, um, the, the, so the question is because we got a mixed system, right? The copper and, and steel or carbon steel, keeping that pH in that range is a lot of times done with your chemistry as well as with your, um, uh, your blowdown. 
So that's why we monitor it. That's why we test. Fortunately, you can do pH pretty quickly with these meters anymore. Just push the button and get a reading pretty quick. On occasion, you need to bring it down. But most of the products that we provide, as well as most of our competitors, have, you know, because copper is what we call amphoteric. So if you get too high of a pH or too low, it wants to corrode. Iron only wants, really wants to corrode as you get really low, right? So, so for instance, um, with copper, once we start getting over about a nine, nine and a half, it wants to corrode. Just like if once we start getting down below like five or 5.9 or whatever, or six, roughly in that area, copper will start to want to go away. That's why we try to maintain it in that higher range. But with the, like I said, our, our products, as well as most of our competitors, have corrosion inhibitors in with their product. So it's not just treating scale, it's, it's maintaining some corrosion protection. So we've got you know, various things for coppers and, and you know, yellow and red brass, as well as for the carbon steel to help prevent them from going away too, you know, too quickly. It's also pretty common for them to use corrosion coupons also. So it's a, it's a small little, you know, piece of metal that's got a mass already measured on it prior to putting it in. You put it in, you log the date, and when you put it in, and then you've got the, the known mass originally, and then six months or a year later, or however long later, you take it out, you send it for mass analysis, you, then you can determine what your actual corrosion rate is. So ASME has a standard for that. That's what they call acceptable corrosion rates on like an open system, like the cooling tower, for instance. And that's that's typically about two mils per year for carbon steel and 0 0.2 mils per year for copper. It's like just a rule of thumb. We want to be less than that, obviously. And we, again, we do that with the, the water treatment chemistry that we add to them. So yes, they're, they're dual. That's why we try to maintain in the you know, a range closer between like eight and a half and nine, because there, it's, it's, it's a happier medium. That would keep everybody happy. It keeps everything or, yeah, reasonably yeah. happy. You know, the carbon steel is dramatically cheaper. And traditionally, if you building was done right, they didn't use schedule 10 pipe everywhere. You know, they use at least schedule, you know, 20, 40, or 80, depending on how great the system was designed. It will typically last well longer than your cooling tower. The tricky part is the cooling tower. Where you've got galvanized sidewalls and stuff. Well, they don't get your tower chemistry on every surface. Most of it's just humidity and evaporation. Well, that's basically distilled water, and it's constantly attacking the metal. There's very little we can do with that unless you physically coat it and go in there because you know the water the treatment that we put in there only makes it into the water column that's flowing so wherever that water is actively flowing you're getting some of this, the corrosion inhibitors as well as scale inhibitors where it's not which is that big box of space inside the thing that's got all that humidity and evaporation going through with fan is blowing yeah. that's constantly attacking the tower so that was a tricky one that's why you see a lot of towers with that rust ring around the Top of the fill pack, right, right there, because it's a lot of just humidity. Just caught. Yeah. Does that answer the question? <laughs> online, to some degree. Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah. How about uh, difference between soft scale and hard scale? Um, that primarily is more to do with what what quality and concentration of your uh, your inhibitors are in there so softer scale being a little more granular the, the again most of the treatments that are used today are phosphonates for you know in cooling tower systems and what they really are is what we call crystal modifiers so they interfere with that that build up of any scale that does happen by basically putting dissimilar shapes in there so they can't get all hard normal scale if that's all it is it just layers on top of itself and it's incredibly well bonded and that's where you get that hard scale. So it's primarily hard scale is almost purely like your calcium carbonate or your calcium bicarb that are really, that, and it's very uniform. But if we if you get enough inhibitors in there during that production of scale, you'll get softer scale that ideally you can brush out or if there is, if you do have that period of time where 
You know, you might have lost some control of your cycles in your cooling tower to get a little high and hit that threshold of hardness and alkalinity. Ideally, if you've got enough scale inhibitor in there, anything that does will fall out and it'll be more granular and fall in the basin or go through the blowdown or something that you can, you know, at least knock off a lot easier. But that's primarily what, you know, how you get those formed. Unless you've got just a whole bunch of other, like, I've seen some buildings where they lost blowdown line and it was just stuck shut for a long period of time and it cycled up to like 60 some thousand conductivity, you know, micro Siemens or, you know, and it basically smells almost like seawater. Well, now you've got so many other salts and stuff in there all competing. And what, what happens is, again, the, the calcium is less soluble in that situation and it's going to fall out. So, because the only other things are competing to be dissolved in that water, it's kind of like, you know, it'd be like a, a, a mosh pit. The smallest one, the, the weakest ones that are the least capable of staying in there are going to get booted out, right? Well, they're going to be, they're going to fall out on whatever surface they can. First place is going to be your heat exchange surface. But second, when once it hits threshold, I mean, if I started to keep, kept pouring salt in that bob, that thing, at some point it's not, no more is going to dissolve in there. Right, you hit saturation, and that's what will happen. You, you, and there's a there's a page in this handbook that talks about LSI, and it's again, it's a it, there's a um, that was one of them. it's a little tough to look with Langley saturation index, and it's basically a chart. It talks it shows it, it it charts your temperature, your your hardness concentration, your alkalinity, and your pH, and the, when you chart all of those, you can find out okay how much hardness can I keep in that system and it gets it's on the page 15 so once you get to that threshold it's going to fall out no matter what somewhere and it's usually like I said first on the heat exchange surfaces but Go on. at some point you get enough coating on there where there's not enough heat anyways to make a difference this is going to fall out anyway you know you really see it just literally laying at the bottom of your pan in the basin but if it's soft, that's a that's a better scenario. You can deal with it a lot easier. Um, sometimes it's still just hard enough that you can't just brush it out. Like I've seen in some chillers, you, you still gotta you know do some other more aggressive treatment, and then those tend to be a lot more violent than the hard stuff because it's it's really surface area. You got a greater surface area for all your acids or whatever you're using to break it down. So it gets really aggressive and off, you know, off gassing all your CO2. Very good. Anything more on that topic? No, we're good. Very well explained. Thank you. So, um, in so we talked, like I said, with conductivity. So we've got ions, right? So what is an ion? Ion is anything that can dissociate in water. So table salt. So you got sodium and chloride. When they dissolve, you've got a sodium ion and you've got a chloride ion. Right? They both se separate. You still have salt in the water. You'll still taste it like salt, just like if you ate it. But there's they separate water. And part of it is um, because of the unique structure of water, right? What's water made out of? H2O, right? Sure. I should just take it up here. Hydrogen. We got we got H hydrogen. Right? That's a big water molecule right there, right? We got two hydrogens and one oxygen. Each hydrogen has a little plus charge on it, and the oxygen has two negatives, right? But it, it's shaped in this sort of yeah, scenario. So what happens is, again. what happens is you've got a net positive charge here and a net negative charge on this side of the deal. So when you've got sodium and chloride in there, Where's the sodium going to go? It's in the trap, right? Sodium is Na. And the chlorides will be up here because the chloride has a negative and the sodium has a positive charge. That's essentially what they're doing. They're just soaking in water and they're kind of, they're kind of like hanging on, like almost like a magnet, if you will. But it, you know, on an ionic kind of basis. So that, that's essentially what an ion is. There's a lot of anything that's anything that's ionic will dissociate in water. So we can do a little, uh, a little. Let's see if I can, where is it? There we go. 
Okay, I've got some sugar here. If I put sugar in water, will it have problem? Will it increase conductivity, decrease conductivity? What have no change? What's going to happen? Thanks. We'll start with here's here's my here's my water that I got here. I've got roughly 1,017 microsieverts, or you know your conductivity, right? 1,017, right? If I add sugar into it, what's it going to do? Can you do anything? What's sugar? Tastes good. What the wife called me. <laughs> I say it's going to increase. Oh, say sugar is going to increase it because it would increase the TDS, correct? Because if it's dissolved, that's going to leave. So you know. see, so it's going to dissolve. You saw what that poured in there. There's a nice pile of white powder in there, right? So a couple minutes of this. And what happens when you send it back in a row, everyone? Look at that, like now it's showing me at like 912. It's less. Wow. But normally it would be the sugar. I mean, it may be just the jar made of it. It's more pure. But really, if you added, if I added salt, what would it do? I can add salt to that same solution with that sugar in it. Right? Move that little swirl. And then how much I put in there will determine what happens. So then we saw we had like, yeah, we saw we had 916 right now. I put so much in there on it, 73,000. Oh, wow. Okay. With just that little bit of salt. So this definitely dissociates in the water, right? It splits up big time, and that allows a current. Sugar does not. Sugar stays a sugar molecule in the water. Okay, it stays. It doesn't. It doesn't break apart into its constituent parts. It's still sugar. So what what sugars typically do is what we call they hydrolyze. They just kind of like hang out and float around in there. But they still they don't actually dissolve. They're they're really more like you know, their own component that's just sort of floating around. Them. So that they, and they, have, they have conductivity. They have nothing to do with any conductivity. They just kind of hang out. And so the, the electrons they don't change yet, and they don't, and, but there is still a solubility limit. There's only so much you can get to kind of solubilize. Will the sugar change your TDS at all? No. Hmm. Because again, because it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't, right. doesn't right. split up. It's just there. Well, yeah. yeah. So it's 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 interesting. So you're like, oh, okay. Well, so what the heck happened? You know, somebody threw a bunch of uh, sugar in your tower, and you're wondering why you got crystals growing everywhere. Well, taste them. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but I have but I have been like I said, some towers where they had low down valve got shut off for like weeks, and I went and showed up, and you could smell it in the air. You, I opened the panel and it was, the water was almost yellow. It had so much salt in it. You, it smelled like you were at the ocean. It I was, was not very I was not very okay. No, they, that, was, that was a customer we quickly took over. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, open the valve, drain it now. <laughs> so now, then that leads to the next one look, suspended solids. Suspended solids, right? So what would that be? That would, that would be things like dirt and debris that blow in, right? They're, they kind of, they're sort of floating in that water and it makes that murky, that, or you see, you may have heard the word turbidity. That's, a, that's basically what that is. That causes some issues in your system by fouling things up, clogging strainers and doing all kinds of other things. But it's, just, it's another term that you'll hear through this. Um, microbiological activity. Now, if we got a bunch of sugar in there, what are they going to do? They're going to grow big time, right? But they also like a lot of other dissolved things to a certain degree. So, and then you're in a perfect temperature environment for a lot of them, which most of your cooling power systems, you're right in that sweet spot, you know, 
70 to 80 degrees, mm -hmm. 90 degrees, you know, and if you got a lot of sunlight in, you'll start seeing that. So we want to definitely control that. So again, don't put sugar in your tower thinking that, oh, well, great, I'm going to get all the little things out of there. No, you'll start growing those things too, right? But we try to impress you. Know, <laughs> to that end, you know, like biological organisms, when they break down, some of them might break apart. They do naturally have sugars in them as well, right? You know, photosynthesis. I mean, what does a plant do? It's basically converting sunlight into sugars, right? So that leads to more growth, but it doesn't increase your productivity. So you can't really tell if you never go out there and physically look at the cooling tower. What's going on out there? Is it growing trees or do I have lemongrass in the thing or what? You know, like, oh. see it all. <laughs> it is one of my own. Uh, we'll briefly go on, like, we'll briefly, you know, silica, we come on the street. Um, silica, we already talked about that. Iron and copper, most of you won't worry about testing it. It's one of those things, again, if you're using corrosion coupons, you'll have an idea. But you'll see iron, copper and iron concentration sometimes in your closed loop, your, you know, your chilled water, if you will, or your heating hot water stuff sometimes. And there are there are limits to how much of that we want in there because it will start to set, you know, settle out. But those would be, they, you can have both suspended and copper and iron because they can they will dissolve but they can be they can still be in the metallic form as well so they, they can be both so if it's suspended it's not going to add conductivity if it's dissolved you would see maybe a slight increase but it's one of those things you'd have to monitor over time shouldn't be tested for at least annually yeah periodically especially if you've got concerns or something going on or if you're starting to see leaks and stuff places um some of these other ones we briefly talked about approach temperature, that's that difference in temperature between the exiting water of the heat exchanger and the temperature of the liquid being cooled. On a chiller, you're looking at, you know, on a cooling tower on power, you want to get to the wet bulb, but you on a chiller system with the compressor, you're trying to get to that separation temperature of the refrigerator. So that's why their, their calculations are a little bit different on approach. You know, so you so true approach is maybe different depending on what type of system you're talking about, whether it be like a regular cooling tower, if you have a condenser approach, EVAP approach, maybe just your cooling tower approach. That's where you're trying to, you know, like I've seen people try to set their, uh, their tower temperature to like, you know, 60 degrees and then the wet bulbs at 65 and at that time of year, you're like, well, you're never going to get there. So the thing's never going to stop running. You're just fighting thermodynamics. You know, it's never going to happen. Um, we've already kind of briefly talked about these things on the next page, acid, caustic. Uh, caustic is really what we want to do to raise pH. We save a lot of chemical, you know, our chemicals and most of our competitors that mainly we try to get those compounds to go into the stain solution for treatment. They have, they have very little new tower because usually we're feeding, you know, ounces to thousands of gallons so they, they don't make a big dramatic change to your ph in your system by dosing it unless you just overfed everything or had a, had some other malfunction soda ash i mean lime these are things that you might use on really massive systems right on anything that you guys are traditionally looking at probably not power plants might use stuff like that um, or they might use it in various other treatment processes prior to feed water you know, trying to settle things out or, you know, balance the pH ahead of time before they're using it. Um, biocides, hopefully you're all using those. Because <laughs> again, you can treat for scale and corrosion, but if you don't treat for the bio, biologic side of things, that could be algaes, bacteria, molds, any of those things, they can all be prevalent. Especially if you're in and around them, you don't want to get sick. Well, if, if, if you put a biocide into your tower, and you have a blowdown that is working correctly, and it's blowing into a, uh, a roof drain. Yeah. Why do you get algae growing in your roof drain, but not in your system? Sunlight? Sunlight's one. Two, you've got a lot less volatility churning over that water. And three, then it sits there in the sunlight, drop, you know, kind of just bam. Uh, and that biocide does break down over time and it does get consumed. And at some point, you may not have enough, you know, biocide in one of those blowdowns. We're dependent on the cycle. And it starts once it gets, once you get a certain concentration of the growth, 
it can it can either overwhelm the biocide you have, or what's persistent may have a resistance to it. So it's it's again we, we talk about it, you know, or you'll see more literature if you read through this on biocides. One of the reasons why we try to alternate instead of just using one all the time. So if you're only feeding bromine all the time, or you're only feeding a non-oxidizer all the time, it can build up a resistance. So those whatever's surviving in there through each generation, they get stronger and stronger. That you know, just it's, 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 it's essentially, yeah. you know, so eventually when it gets into the system, it starts working, 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 and it, it gets hard. Yeah, well, and, it, and that's about the time it gets blown up. Well, it's, it's more like you constantly have an influx with the wind and everything else. New yeah. spores blowing in, and if they can reproduce. Then they can build up another resistance, and then you just go through enough reproduction cycles because their lifespan is so short, and their reproductive cycles are much more rapid that they can build it up over a period of time a lot faster than like you or I. But you know, it's it, it's akin to going to the gym every day. You get stronger, right? You know, you get used to it, and at some point, you're lifting the same weight, you're not getting the same results. Well, that's because you kept doing the same thing, and it's your body's not responding to it anymore. It's like, well, whatever, this is easy, you know. Kind of a that. No. Some of you may need to use anti foams on occasion. That's usually if you overfed bromine, <laughs> but uh, it can come up from other things. So. And foam also come from forms of biology. Yeah, exactly. That's partly why. It's got a bunch of bromine to a system with a bunch of growth in it. You're not likely to get a bunch of foam. So, it'll help kill the growth. Yes, but you, you need to do it appropriately. I know most of those times, if you need to shock the tower, you need to do a couple site hits on it once, and then a day or two later, hit it again, and then a day or two later, hit it again, because the way the organisms respond is they'll they'll switch from, um, you know, just consumption and growth to all reproduction and to try to overwhelm that biocide. So that, that, that's when you might smell it sometimes. They call it an ammonia flush. It's all of a sudden smell all this, like, you know, it smells like the sea next to a bunch of seagulls where they're all over the rocks, you know, it smells like ammonia farm, stinks. That's because of that, right? That's what you're smelling. When the biocide hits, that's what you smell. Uh, don't, just, don't just continue to keep slugging it. Yeah, and you're better to do, you're better to days. give it a slug. Let it wait a second and hit it again, yeah. or use two different types, a non oxidizer and an oxidizer. And you can have great success in like three, four days. Really, really, really. Yeah, one uh, basically prevents growth, which is non oxidizer, so it doesn't allow them to reproduce. And then the other one will actually kill them off. All together. Totally different mechanisms. Yeah. So one is basically trying to neuter or spay the yeah. things, and the other one is there to actively. Burn the cell. That's what the oxidizers do, like your bromines or chlorines and stuff like that. So there, there's a lot more on some of these, some of those terms through these pages. So we don't need to burn through all those. You know, this page on pH there, um, some of the impurities. It gives you a lot more detail reading. Um, a lot more on conductivity and ions and stuff. So how we have time here? Six minutes. Cycle concentration was a good one because it was kind of out there. So, what is cycles of concentration? How many times do you use what you water? How many times you get used it? So, as a calculation, there's a couple quick ones you can use your conductivity. So, you look at your tower conductivity versus your city conductivity. You know, one divided by the other tells you how many times you're using it. You can do the same thing with your alkalinity or your hardness test. If you map all those, you'll see is if they're all pretty close, all saying like three or four within a couple, of, you know, decimal, couple decimal points, then you're like, okay, I've got a pretty good, well balanced system. If any one of those is way out of range from another one, then you look at your logs and say, oh, did the city just change? Or do I need, or am I low on my power chemistry? And that's usually what it is, is the power chemistry. Um, and there's some calcs in there to determine that. Um, what are we talking about? Cycles is that one, and, and then there, there's also a calculation on there for blowdowns. So, that how you can determine your blowdown rate? So, you'll know if you're doing too much or not. So, that's evaporation divided by the number of cycles you have minus one. So, if you calculate cycles, 
then you, and you know what your tower tonnage is, you know what your research rate is. Once you know what your evaporation rate is, then you can calculate your evaporation rate by your research rate. So let's say you've got a 3,000 gallon per minute research rate. That means you've got 30 gallons a minute of evaporation. So you'd have 30 on top. And if you're running, let's say you're running three cycles, you got 30 divided by three minus one, because that's all in the parentheses, right? So that's 30 divided by two gives you 15, right? Now, if we bump to four cycles, that you get, that's blow down. So now let's do 30 divided by four minus one, which is equals 10. So by going up one cycle from three cycles to four cycles, I just saved you five gallons a minute of blowdown. That means five gallons a minute less makeup. It means five dollars a minute less in your water. Bill. But it's the same time property managers have gotten a two because that's how they scale it. Right. So that's why we can only go so high because we will again we get our threshold. But here's the problem. As we keep going up, let's say we tried five. Right? So that's 30 divided by four. What's that? That's like we're at like 8.25 or whatever, right? So let's just call it eight for all intents and purposes. I only gained another two. So at some point. As you, you know, when you hear some of these guys try to tell you, oh, we can do eight cycles. Well, the, your risk factor is going vertical or asymptotic, and your benefit is going, is plateauing. You're getting less and less benefit from exponential risk. So there's, there's a point where, you know, eight cycles is about the limit anybody really is willing to do anyways. You don't get that much extra bang for your buck. You can still have the same amount of evaporation. And you still have, you know, to make up that, but you're gaining for each additional cycle, you're gaining an incrementally less, you know, value for your efforts and a lot more risk because if something changes, it goes haywire quick. So for people that don't know that, what is the recommended cycle? On your, well, so here in Arizona, mm -hmm. we're typically limited out by our harvest and alkalinity levels and that's determined by the power of chemistry that we're feeding. Ours allows you to go up to 600 parts per million, but traditionally we're getting about 150 parts per million out of the city. So that limits us at about four. Okay. 150 times four gives you 600. So that's typically the first thing that we hit for anything else. Wherever I hit conductivity or my pH limits, and even my hardness. It's just that's usually what it is. And there's there's part of the town where it's coming out of the tap. And, at 220 alkaline. Now I can't even do three. That would be like 660. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm really I'm like kind of on that bubble of risk. You, and you just you don't, it's it's just not worth it to have acceptable amount of scale formation. It it doesn't serve you any better. So you're better off just lowering the set. I wouldn't think you'd want any scale. You don't want it. I you know that's not as acceptable. Bad yeah. Yeah. It's bad one. So uh, let's see. There's some more reading on different tower systems. You guys have probably all seen them. Fourth draft, induced draft, natural draft. So there's various different ones out there. Um, efficiency. We've got a copy of log sheets in there for like a normal chiller, whatnot. Um, you guys, anybody with chiller systems usually have log sheets they got to do like a week. So you'd be all familiar with that. And the only other one, if we got a minute, is is the corrosion and the nobility chart. So if you look on thirteen real quick, you'll see the reason for the nobility is because it's like they're they're like immune to corrosion if they're high nobility. So right, so we think of platinum's and golds. But on the chart, you'll see where copper lies and steel lies and zinc and then aluminum. Right, they're all lower on that chart. Which means that they're much more susceptible to corrosion. And because steel is lower than copper, that's you know, that's why we've got to protect it because most of your systems have a lot of like steel or iron in there, right? Car, you know, carbon steel all over the place. It is lower. So we definitely focus on the corrosion treatments on the steel a little bit more than the copper. Because it is more resistant. And you think of all the copper pipe in your domestic water, it's all, you know, it's great. So you get a bunch of 
scale on it. Yeah. Then it wants, then it will corrode because copper and concrete don't mix. Don't like it. pH of the concrete is way too high for it. So it steals tons of copper ions and makes it corrode. Carbon steel, on the other hand, is great for concrete. It's why they use rebar, right? Mm -hmm. So if we if we go up that pH chart, the carbon steel doesn't care. Copper does, even though it has higher mobility. So, so why don't they make cooling towers out of gold and platinum? Ooh. It's too expensive. <laughs> yeah. You think the tweakers are already stealing copper? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, there's a big hole today. Yeah. So that's one to really look at real quick. Um, you know, we, we can go over tower chemistry all day long, but that this very last page 20 gives you kind of a rough chart. And forgive us for the, the dollar amounts that we have on there because we haven't updated it with what the current rate is because it changes all the time. But it shows you for roughly like 500 ton chiller. You know what their what their kilowatts per ton they're using load factor if they're at 100 percent and all that what the incremental little limited amounts of scale build up on those tubes how much that can increase the cost of running that chiller to try to maintain your city system so it's pretty amazing if you looked at this one at that current rate back then it'd be like maybe 192,000 a year to run it in perfect condition but with even with even one mill, you added another $17,000 a year to that operation, just on the energy cost alone. And with two mills, you're at 34. By the time you get to five mills, you're up to almost a 45% reduction in the energy efficiency. And only five mills. I've seen a lot of children do a lot more than five mills on. <laughs> in this town, do you find that you find more uh, scale? Or just corrosion of the, the chassis of the tower. Or um no matter, like I said, when, when it comes to the tower chemistry side of things, if you've got great chemistry consistent it's it's same, same. scale, right? You'll still see corrosion on the tower, especially if they're galvanized, because they're what the you can't get chemistry, chemistry to the way without it. physically going in there with a sprayer and doing it all the time. What? Because that's all just evaporation and then condensation. So that kind of condensed water is pure water. So if it's well taken care of, your, your water treat. Yeah, you won't have any scale. Your tubes are probably going to outlast. Yeah, the, the oh, yeah. exactly. The tube bundle will outlast the shell by a long shot. But it's also one of the reasons why I've been a little more inclined around here. It might take a little bit bigger footprint and reconfiguration, but I, I do. Kind of like some of these buildings that have just an open tower, all stainless, so then you don't have to deal with corrosion, and then a heat exchanger instead of a tube bundle. That's for those places that have really bad water treatment companies, and they're just in their constantly scaling them up because you can't you can't descale a tube bundle to save your life. You physically can't, you know, especially unless it's stainless. If it's galvanized, you just can't do it. Because you kill the patient trying to get rid of the scale. You basically corrode the whole thing up. You can't get in between all those tubes. You know, there's a bundle mm -hmm. so big, you can't get to those middle ones. You can get acid and stuff on top. And by the time you get to the middle, it's, it's neutralized somewhat. And now you ate all the scale off here. Now you're just eating through metal before you even get to the scale down here. You know, you just you really can't do it. You're stuck just in place. Yeah. Any other questions? Anything else online? All right, thanks for coming, James. And uh, anybody has any questions or anything, they can get a hold of me. Yeah. A lot of you got my information already that are here, but I can leave some cards. Me and, and, and I'm gonna, me and Jen will send out an email. Yeah, I'm gonna set I'll send that out because they're yeah. they were all asking for it, and then I'll do it company wide with your um, both your V cards. Sure. I need your your beer. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank you.